All right. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, my name is Nancy McLaren Kennedy, and I'm a peer specialist and mental health worker at the Royal Ottawa in the women's mental health. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this Facebook live chat. We're very happy to see you today or, or know that you're listening. And to anyone who's listening in the future, we also are happy that, that you're doing so. So I wanted to let you know that the Facebook Live is a collaboration between the Ottawa Birth and Wellness Center and Women's Mental Health at the Royal. So as part of the project, we are providing mental health uh, education to perinatal people. And we believe by providing up-to-date and correct information about pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and breastfeeding during during COVID-19, the anxiety of the unknown can be decreased. So that's really what we're hoping to achieve through this presentation. And I also just wanted you to know that Women's Mental Health at the Royal is um, supported and funded by Philanthropy, which um, one of our major fundraisers is the Shoppers Run for Women, which um, are, is still accepting applications to run um, or walk. And you can also be a front, uh, donate if you're not able to run or walk. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to be doing is listing these links. So um, the links for the Women's Mental Health at the Royal and also um, the Run for Women in the information section on the side. So I wanted to um, let you know that we're going to be taking questions at the end of the talk. And so I know sometimes that you have a question that you want to write down, you're worried that you're not going to have it at the end. So as we're going along, feel free to uh, write any questions that you have in the comment section. And I'll go there at the end of both um, at, at the end of both speakers and I'll read your questions. So first I'd like to um, introduce Teresa Bandrowska. She um, has been a windwife since 1988, serving childbearing families in Ottawa and Quebec. She was a founding member, is a founding member of the Gatineau Birth Centre and the Midwifery Group of Ottawa. Now retired from active practice, she has been the lead midwife at the Ottawa Birth and Wellness Centre since 2003. So thank you for joining us, Teresa. <laughs> You're very welcome. I'll just correct it. Uh, we've only been open since 2013, Nancy. Mm, so good point. I took on the job as lead midwife. Thank um, you. Thank you, Nancy. So I wanted to, again, welcome everybody here um, live and later on. Um, and I wanted to just go over a little bit about what we're going to do today. So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the feelings that might be coming up now. Uh, some of the uncertainty. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about what the birth center is doing, uh, some of the changes that have occurred at the birth center in response to this pandemic. And I do have a very short little uh, meditation exercise or a little breathing exercise that I can share at the end. Um, and then Nicole's going to speak about uh, pregnancy care, labor and birth care, and postpartum care and baby care for uh, clients, um, whether it's home or hospital. Um, and after that, we're going to have some time to answer those questions. Um, so not just questions, but if you have any tips that have served you well for supporting yourself, your family, or um, people who are watching this who are perhaps supporting someone who is pregnant or has given birth, any tips you have uh, would be very welcome. And um, we'll, uh, we'll also be looking at that, uh, those comments in the next week to see if there's any additional questions that we can then respond to. We also have a resource list that will be posted and uh, with lots of good resources in our community for people um, around labor, birth, uh, pregnancy, anxiety, depression, um, and uh, breastfeeding, to name a few. So I just wanted to acknowledge that birth is, and pregnancy and birth are momentous occasions in someone's life. They're uh, fraught with uncertainty at the best of times. There's a lot of unknowns. 
um, there's a sense of not being able to control things. And it's such a unique time in your life, even if it's your 10th baby, it's still unique to that pregnancy, that baby. And a lot of fears and anxieties can come up at the best of times. And that's very normal. And now we have, in addition to all that, this global pandemic, which has the potential to increase that anxiety, to increase the unknown, to increase the stress for people. So those fears might be greater because uh, possibly there are financial worries, decreased support, especially in person, perhaps food insecurity, um, decreased chance to go out and exercise, sleep disturbances. Um, there's also increased responsibility. Some of you may, may be dealing with not just being pregnant and anticipating and planning for your birth and after, but you might have children at home that you need to either homeschool or take care of. You still have to clean the house and make the meals and you might also be working and all those competing, um, competing activities can also increase your stress level and put being pregnant on top of that and it, and it can be a really difficult time. So I just also wanted to say pregnancy is a time that um, intimate partner violence and abuse can increase. Um, it can sometimes first be uh, manifest at this time, at the time of pregnancy. And at this time of isolation and the increased stress, this is something that we have a potential to see a rise in. So I wanted to really, really stress that help is available if you do find yourself stressed or you have um, violence in the home, there are resources to reach out for and we have listed them. Uh, they'll be listed in, on our Facebook page and on the Birth Center's website. Um, so I want to acknowledge that this is a scary time for all, for everybody. This is uh, unprecedented. Um, it has been, you know, coming on a couple of months now that we've been in this, but still there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty. And fear and anxiety are normal reactions when there is um, uncertainty and the unknown and rapid changes and, and a feeling of a loss of control. Those are totally normal emotions to be experiencing and we're all doing the very best we can given the circumstances. Know that your feelings are not right or wrong. Feelings are your feelings, they just are. And so acknowledging them and that you're not wrong for feeling the way you do is definitely goes a long way towards healing. Um, knowledge is power. So one of the ways that we can regain a sense of control and have a sense of uh, understanding is if we really can inform ourselves. And so, um, just being able to understand what is going on, what are the light, what's the likely scenario to the best of what anybody knows, what is the likely scenario to occur when you're ready to have your baby, or if you've had your baby already, what can you expect? And that knowledge can really go a long way. So one of the things that we really, um, really support is making sure you speak to your care provider. Your care provider is your go-to person to ask questions. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to remember what questions you might want to have asked um, when you're in an appointment. Uh, the virtual appointments I know can be longer, but those in-person appointments are often quite short. Nevertheless, even in a virtual appointment, it's sometimes hard to remember what you want to ask. And many of us feel that we don't want to take up too much time. But I would really encourage you, one of the things you can do is write down your questions before you see your healthcare provider and ask those questions. And if you don't quite understand the answer, ask again, because that can really go a long way. Um, also, I wanted to say that pregnancy and birth um, and having a baby and feeding a baby, that hasn't really changed. It's still a very normal physiological process. It's uh, that that piece hasn't changed at all. 
So you can control some of the factors around that. For example, making sure that you have um, yourself in the best possible health. Uh, that involves, of course, good nutrition, plenty of water, exercise where you can get it um, outside if you can, or have a dance party, walk some stairs, make sure you get some movement into your day. Um, rest and good sleep are essential. So if you're having sleep difficulties, that's another reason to reach out. Um, how cultivating uh, some relaxation downtime, which could involve meditation or prayer, or just a practice of simple gratitude, or just uh, doing something for yourself, uh, peace and quiet bath, for example, if you can manage it. So having that time to reset, to, to just have that moment of calm in your day is so important. Cultivate your support systems. Who around you, friends, family, who can you go to for extra support? Meal preparation, um, support online with the children, other children perhaps. Um, right now we're, our support systems are virtual and that's, that has a, that's a little different than what we're used to, but you can still get a lot of support from friends and family that way. So reach out and um, know that you, you still have a right to understand your options. So when you speak to your caregiver, make sure that you understand the proposals that are being given to you. You understand the pros and cons of those options and know that you have an absolute right to choose what you feel are the best options for you. That hasn't changed. Um, know too that caregivers are doing the very best they can. Right now, all caregivers have been keeping up to date with recommendations from Ottawa Public Health, from their colleges, um, from their regulatory bodies, from their institutions that they work in. And we're all doing the very best we can to be kept abreast of the latest evidence, the latest recommendations. And our focus, caregivers focus really is to provide the very best care to maintain the health and safety of you and your family, of the healthcare workers around you, and of our general community at large. We really are all in this together. And know that your midwives, your doctors, your nurses, your birth center aides, if you're at our wonderful birth center, they're all smiling behind those masks. You may not see it, but they are. And they're still providing and maintaining the very best of care. They are our frontline workers and we honor them and know that they are there to serve you. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about uh, the birth center. So for those of you who don't know, our birth center is a place where if you have a midwife providing you care, you can choose to come and have your baby. The birth center is, uh, has eligibility criteria that really, um, it's really to allow for people who are healthy, who have healthy pregnancies at term, so no premature babies, um, who um, who's ba have one baby head down. So basically a normal healthy person with a normal healthy pregnancy who starts a normal healthy labor can come to the birth center and have their baby. And I encourage you to go on to our website and learn more if you don't, uh, if you don't know about the birth center. We have always had measures in place uh, around infection prevention and control. From the moment we started, we've always had policies around cleaning and disinfection about appropriate personal protective equipment. I think everybody now knows what PPE stands for. But so what we've done in addition, um, some of the changes we've made at the birth center that might affect you if you're planning to have your baby there is we have implemented further screening. We've always done uh, sort of a quick questionnaire of infection screening, um, screening everybody who comes in for signs and symptoms of, of infection. We are screening right now um, all the midwives who are coming in, all the clients and their support people, and that includes the taking of a temperature. 
that's the one thing that we've en enlarged upon. We're also limiting the number of people that are going into the center. So we don't have any visitors. Um, we don't have any uh, staff even. Most staff are not going into the center. They're working from home. Our birth center aides are only going in when there's a birth happening or when they need to accept a delivery, for example. So we're limiting how many people are actually physically walking into the center. Um, we have rigorous, as I said before, um, terminal cleaning, which means cleaning and disinfection of all equipment, all surfaces, um, the whole room where a client has been, everything is cleaned and disinfected meticulously between visitors. We also have all staff that are working with a client there. So all birth center aides and, med and midwives have uh, PPE that they're wearing. So you will see mask people that are masked and gowned um, and gloved that are present to serve you during your labor and birth. Um, the other thing we're doing, and this affects people, it's, it's an unfortunate reality. In addition to limiting just visitors to come and tour the center, we are limiting support people. Um, so that when you're going into labor and you go into the birth center, you can only have one support person, your choice, but one support person who can't come and go and can't be switched out with somebody else. So that can be hard. But uh, so that means that you, you maybe you wanted to have a photographer with you, maybe you wanted to have a doula with you, your friends, your family, your mom, your mom in law. Unfortunately, we can't have that right now. And we are watching for recommendations as to when those restrictions can be lifted. Um, I know that is hard, but I know that a lot of people are providing virtual support. So the doulas are providing virtual support. Family members can attend the labor virtually. And that's something we would support with our free Wi-Fi, for example. Um, so in addition to limiting visitors, we've also closed on our wellness center side. There are no more tours in person. There are no more information sessions or classes, prenatal classes, um, other workshops. All of those have been canceled in person, but many of them are continuing online. So I encourage you to still look at our website and see what you might be able to join online. Um, we also have uh, changed the policy that nobody is going to be admitted in early labor to walk around the center. Really, you are going to be admitted when you're in active labor. We want to limit the amount of time people are in the center. And at this point, we are restricting the use of laughing gas or nitrous oxide. Um, so because of the potential risk of what we call aerosolization, so it might pose an increased risk of uh, infecting the people around someone who may be asymptomatic, who may be infected with COVID-19, but not showing any symptoms. So for the moment, there's no nitrous oxide in the birth center being used, but it's still the same birth center. We still have lovely private rooms, um, big comfortable tubs. You can still have a water birth and we're watching for those recommendations. But as of now, the evidence supports continuing to use water and labor. We have lovely walk-in showers. You have freedom of movement and the use of things such as birth stools or peanut balls or exercise balls and slings. And so that you are able to move freely in the center in the space. We still have the birth center aides supporting the midwives in a non-clinical role. You still have your midwives. And so the birth center hasn't changed. We want to make sure your experience is as comfortable and satisfying as possible. <coughs> Pardon me. So just to kind of uh, wrap up a little bit, I wanted to uh, again remind people, um, we acknowledge your feeling. We acknowledge the frustration, the anger, the anxiety, the fear. Those are all totally understandable emotions. Um, and we want to make sure 
to, to, to remind you to reach out, you know your baseline, you know yourself, you know your body, you know your baby, you are the expert. And if you feel that you need some extra support, be it uh, practical support like uh, food or um, support with childcare, be it support um, for anxiety, for depression, for um, support in a difficult situa domestic situation, there are resources out there. Um, you are not alone, you've got this, you can still have your baby just the same as if it wasn't a pandemic more or less. So I wanted to encourage you to remember, remember that birth is still the same, really. Um, so what I wanted to do just before we ask Nicole to go ahead and, and speak a little bit um, from the clinical midwife point of view, I have a very quick uh, exercise that you might find useful if you do find yourself overwhelmed and you have just a minute or a few moments to to just take a, a, a take some time and and uh, introduce some calm, and this is uh, called a heart hug, and uh, it came to me through uh, Tellington Touch, which is a therapy that works with horses and other am animals, and um, and it's a kind of like a little massage. Works very well for people too. So if you want to join me, just take your hands, put one hand over the other, right on your chest. And then you can close your eyes or you can leave them open. Just take a nice deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth like you were blowing a candle flame to make it flicker. And then take another deep breath in. And as you begin to exhale, just move your hand around in a circle, not lifting them up from your chest, just round in a circle, round the clock, say from 12 o'clock and back up to 12 o'clock and then a little bit past and stop and take another deep breath and around the circle again as you exhale and down to six o'clock and another deep breath and around again right down just past to quarter two and take a moment you've got this and you're not alone. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Nicole now. Oh, just one second, Teresa. So okay. thank you so much for that. I feel really relaxed that that deep breathing activity was wonderful. And I want to let everyone know that Teresa has um, a poem on the Ottawa Birth and Wellness Center site that is about birth during COVID-19. And I really encourage you to read it. It's a, it's a beautiful poem. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, introduce Nicole Pichette, who is a registered midwife with Ottawa South Midwives. Nicole has obtained a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Psychology Behavioural Neuroscience from Acadia University and a Bachelor of Health Science Midwifery Education degree from McMaster University and has completed courses in Behavioural Neuroscience at the graduate level. Nicole is passionate about providing evidence-based care with a focus on informed choice and loves teaching families about pregnancy, labour and delivery and the postpartum period. When not practicing midwifery, you can find Nicole involved in community events around Ottawa and enjoying time with her family at home. Thanks for joining us today, Nicole. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to, to join in today just to talk a little bit more about the clinical aspect of what we're dealing with, with coronavirus. I'm going to start off super, super basic here. Um, I think that with everything that Teresa said was so bang on, I think the overload of information 
is what's so challenging about dealing with this pandemic. So I'm just gonna go super basic just in case you missed this. <laughs> um, a coronavirus, so what is a coronavirus? We'll just start there really quickly. Um, basically coronaviruses are a large family of viruses um, that cause illness to both animals and humans. But COVID-19 is the infectious disease that we're talking about all the time in the media right now. So COVID-19 is coronavirus is sort of interchangeable in the media, um, but just to differ differentiate that a little bit, COVID-19 is what is actually causing illness. Um, COVID-19 is an illness that has sort of spread um, around the world quite quickly, as we know, and it's causing generally pretty mild symptoms in many people, um, including fever, dry cough, runny nose, sore throat, um, gastrointestinal illness like diarrhea. Um, however, there are a, a good number of people that are becoming quite seriously ill with this disease, which is why all of these protocols and procedures are being put in place. It's really to protect as many people as we can from getting seriously ill. Um, so we know that some of the information that we do know is that some people have an underlying health condition that might make them more at risk of becoming seriously ill from this disease. Um, so in order to sort of control the spread a little bit, to control the impact that, it, that this disease is having on our healthcare system, they've been asking that we, you know, do all the social distancing things, um, go, you know, go outside only for very specific reasons or sort of essential reasons, but otherwise trying to stay home and limit your exposure to other people as much as possible. So of course that has trickled down into obstetrical care. Um, and I just want to reiterate that the reason why these changes in rules and procedures um, are being sort of put in place is to protect all of us. So to protect you and your families and your babies, but also to protect midwives and healthcare providers and everybody else who's working hard um, at this time. So I hope that's like a little bit of a helpful sort of jumping off point. Um, but let's talk a little bit more specifically about pregnancy now. So are pregnant women more at risk of catching COVID-19? It's a really good question. Right now, the research on COVID-19 is very limited. So it's kind of coming out really, really quickly. Um, we're trying to learn as much as we can about this disease as quickly as possible. But right now, it doesn't seem like pregnant women are more at risk of becoming severely ill from COVID-19 than the rest of the population. We know that pregnant people um, are a little bit more prone to contracting upper respiratory tract infections in general. So that's coughs, colds, flus. That's because your immune system is a little more um, suppressed during pregnancy. So it's more likely that you'll become sick with an upper respiratory tract infection. But it, And so that includes COVID-19. It's possible that you would be a little more at risk of contracting it, but it does not seem like you would be more at risk of becoming seriously ill as a pregnant person coming into, co into contact with COVID-19. Um, in terms of pregnancy care right now, there's been a number of changes in midwifery care in my own practice and the clinic that I'm affiliated with, but also I think um, in all clinics. So this kind of goes for family physician care, um, care under an obstetrician, but also care under a midwife. The main thing being for your regular prenatal visits, we have limited the number of prenatal visits that we're doing in person. This is based on some evidence that we have from the World Health Organization and a few other guidelines that has looked into the number of in-person visits a healthy pregnant person needs during their pregnancy in order for there to be healthy outcomes for mom and baby. We know that we were seeing pregnant people more frequently than what the guidelines state, which is great in well normal times. We're happy to see pregnant people as regularly as we can, but now, um, in order to limit exposure to healthcare providers and to pregnant people, um, we've cut some of our visits out for in-person visits and made them virtual visits. So like Teresa said, this can be a challenging shift for us. We now have to sort of grapple with technology, with communicating with our healthcare provider, maybe by the phone or maybe using like a virtual platform like we are now. Um, and that can be challenging, but 
It's something that we all have to work hard to embrace. And we definitely encourage you to still ask questions that you need to ask, write them down on your cell phone, write them down on a piece of paper before your virtual visit and chat with us. Let us know what's going on. And like Teresa said, if you are struggling with any resources that you need or whether it, it be sort of tangible stuff like food, um, childcare, et cetera, or for mental health supports, please, tell your provider that, talk to them about what, what you're going through, because we acknowledge that this is really difficult in a number of ways, um, and that manifests differently across different people and different families, different populations. Um, so the virtual visits are one thing that has changed. Um, for midwifery care, we're still on call 24 seven, that has not changed. We're still here for you, we're still very committed, um, but we're just seeing you a little bit less in person. If you felt like something was wrong pertaining to your personal care situation, and you felt like you really needed to talk to a midwife, please page, let your midwife know what's going on or reach out to your care provider and let them know. And they can change, they might, they may be able to change the schedule of visits just depending on what's happening with you. If your blood pressure is creeping, for example, or there's something else clinical going on. Um, it's not sort of a, a black and white situation. We're trying to limit exposure for everyone to keep everyone safe, but it, it can be changed a little bit and that's to keep you and baby safe. So if something's going on, we want to hear about that. So definitely don't hesitate to bring that up. Um, I guess another thing just to touch on, how can you, I think most people know this now, but how can you protect yourself from sort of COVID-19? Um, the, the main um, guidelines are really everywhere in the media right now, but I'll just touch on them. I think it's important. So one is the social distancing stuff. So trying to stay away from groups of people, trying to stay home as much as you can is really important right now. Washing your hands and washing your hands properly. So spending a good amount of time washing your hands with hot water and soap or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer if you can find it. Um, and avoiding touching your mouth, nose and eyes if you're out and about and you haven't, you know, if you've been touching things in the store, for example, avoid touching your face after doing that. Um, those are the main things. If you feel like you're presenting with symptoms of COVID-19 and they're mild, um, you should talk to your care provider about that. Um, if you are getting um, symptoms that are stronger, more severe, I mean, like a, a fever or really having difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, it's time to seek care. So contact your care provider um, and find out what to do based on the latest public health guidelines. Um, you may or may not be tested for COVID-19. It depends sort of on your clinical situation. Um, okay, I'm just going to touch on, there's a lot of questions around uh, whether or not COVID-19 can be transmitted to your unborn baby. This is a really good question. I think as it stands right now, we don't have good evidence to support this. So there may have been one case that sort of looked like there was a vertical transmission. Vertical transmission is from a mom who's sick with COVID-19 passing it to her fetus or her unborn baby, but it wasn't really um, a very clear information. So at this time, there's not enough evidence to demonstrate that if you became sick with COVID-19, you would pass it to your baby. Uh, it's possible though, if you are sick and you give birth, you could pass it to your baby after you know, holding your baby, breathing close to your baby, if you had symptoms of COVID-19. So how do you protect your baby once your baby is born? It's a really good question. Right now, the World Health Organization is recommending if you have symptoms of COVID-19 or confirmed COVID-19 infection, you should wear a mask when you're holding your baby, when your baby is close to you, and you should wash your hands before and after touching your baby, and also uh, disinfect the surfaces around you that you may be touching um, so as to avoid sort of cross-contamination and um, uh, can, you know, passing that infection to your baby. The same thing goes for breastfeeding. So we're getting a lot of questions about whether I should still breastfeed my baby if I were sick with COVID-19. If you are well enough to breastfeed your baby, then yes, you should absolutely breastfeed your baby. The benefits of breastfeeding far, far, you know, are, are just so important for your baby. So putting on a mask, washing your hands, like I said, disinfecting surfaces around you and continuing to breastfeed your baby is really important. In some severe cases, or theoretically, uh, you could be 
quite unwell and not able to breastfeed your baby, that's something to talk to your healthcare provider about. How can you preserve your breast milk supply um, if you're really not able to like, for example, hold and feed your baby? That's something to talk with your midwife or your doctor or nurses about and they can help support you with that. Um, okay, so most of the questions I'm getting these days are about the rules um, around visitors on the birthing unit, um, how many people can I have in the room and sort of how things have changed. So I'll touch on um, what I know about the hospital that I practice at, which is the Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus. Um, Teresa did a really good job sort of giving the rundown of what the birthing center is doing to protect us. Um, so at the Ottawa Hospital at this time, as far as I'm aware, um, the, the sort of main thing is when we're walking into the hospital, anybody is being screened. Okay, so right away there's, there's going to be people waiting there, they're going to be asking you about any symptoms you might have, um, and trying to find out sort of where you're going in the hospital to make sure that um, they're controlling who's walking in, which is a good way to keep all of us safe. They may then screen you again when you reach the birthing unit. Try to have patience with this. People are doing their very best to keep us safe and healthy. Um, so of course this can be challenging if labor is starting, we're feeling a little bit impatient, <laughs> feeling a little bit tired, feeling a little bit cranky, um, but, but we ask for your patience and we really appreciate your patience. You may also have your temperature taken at that point. Um, on the birthing unit, if you are in spontaneous active labor and your midwife or your nurses are admitting you to the birthing unit, you can bring one support person in with you. So usually that is your partner, but it may not be. It may be your mom, it may be your sister, maybe a doula instead, but one support person um, is allowed and we cannot swap out support people. So we couldn't, um, for example, have your doula in for a few hours and then when a doula gets tired, bring your mom in. It's just one support person for the whole labor. Um, some other things to note about the sort of guidelines right now is they really want to stay in the room. So no ambulating the unit, so no walking around the unit, no leaving the unit. Also, no use of the patient kitchen. So you can absolutely bring your own food and we definitely recommend that you do, um, but your nurse or midwife will have to store it in the fridge or you, you know access the microwave for you. That's to limit the number of people sort of congregating in that patient um, kitchen area. So that's another sort of restriction as well. Um, right now at the Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus, if you are having an induction of labor, they are asking that you start your induction of labor by yourself. And when you're in active labor, that's when your partner or support person can join you. This is hard. We, we recognize that this is really challenging, um, but unfortunately, it's just sort of another thing that we have to embrace in this pandemic time, which, which we know is tough. However, what has not been removed, as Teresa pointed out, is virtual support. So if you're finding it really difficult to go through that period by yourself, which I think most people can understand, get, use, your, use your virtual supports, use your phone, use Skype, um, your FaceTime or whatever you need to do. Um, call your midwife if your midwife is not with you at that time and ask for support, you can do that. Um, so there's, there's lots of options there. I think it's hard because you just want people with you. We appreciate how difficult that is. But again, these protocols and procedures are being put in place to keep us all safe and to reduce our exposure. Um, so it is important. Currently, I think the other thing is that um, partners are not being allowed into the operating room. So if your um, labor ends up in a cesarean section, or if you have a scheduled cesarean section, you are not currently allowed to have a partner in the operating room with you. However, your partner will be waiting in the recovery area. So when you're finished with your operation in the operating room, you'll then go into a recovery room where your partner will be waiting for you and you can you know, reconvene and they can meet the baby there. Um, again, we recognize how challenging this is and it's, it's, it's a tough time. It's kind of, I think one of the hardest things is to wrap your head around what's changed, what's happening now, 
and try to not think too far ahead of, okay, well, what's going to change? I had someone ask me, are the hospitals going to shut down? <laughs> and I could just see where the head, you know, where, where the thoughts were going. Like just, it's so overwhelming. It's so much information, so much is changing. And you're already feeling likely pretty, you know, feeling some anxiety around your birth and how it will go, especially if it's your first time. Um, so it's really important, I think, to just take what's in front of you, talk with your care provider about the current guidelines, see if anything's changed and plan as best you can according to that. Um, I think that I touched on pretty much everything I want to touch on. I did, Teresa was asking me earlier just to touch on home birth. So currently home birth, um, the guidelines have not really changed. Again, we're doing what we can to uh, reduce exposure as much as possible to midwives and to families. So we are asking that, you know, only one, one or two support people be with the laboring person, maybe in a separate part of the house. If there's several children or, or other family members living with you, um, we're asking for, for that separation so that we can uh, limit the exposure. We'll also be wearing a mask for the entire time that we're in your home. Um, and when it comes time to, to perform any type of droplet uh, generating procedure, for example, a vaginal exam, putting in an IV, um, catching the baby, we will be wearing full PPE or full personal protective equipment, which usually involves um, a mask with a, a visor, um, maybe a scrub cap as well, a gown and sterile gloves, which is usually what we're wearing anyway. <laughs> um, so I think that that's it in terms of home birth. Um, I don't know, Nancy, do you think I touched on everything? Did you have any questions? Was there anything I missed? No, I think that was really uh, thorough, Nicole. Teresa, do you have any thoughts? No, I just wondered if um, what were the changes in the postpartum visits too, um, in terms of are you're doing more virtual visits, I imagine. Yeah, really good question. Thank you. Um, so some of our postpartum visits will be virtual, but it just depends again on the clinical situation. Um, we are still doing our pretty much we're still doing our routine home visits, although we are wearing sort of like that PPE again, disinfecting everything. <laughs> um, and, but we are still doing the, the home visits, um, which we think is still really important to provide that in the home care. So lots of women are thinking that, you know, they're not gonna get any breastfeeding support, especially with the closure of all the, the groups and drop-ins, but that's not true. We're still definitely providing that support in the home. Um, if it's appropriate to, do, to make a postpartum and visit a virtual visit, then we will do that to try to limit exposure. Um, but it's not always the right thing. Sometimes people really do need that in-person support instead. Okay, great. Um, I just want people to know that I am watching um, the comments on the underneath the, the talk and you can watch our talk from Zoom and then underneath that you can post comments. So I am watching there. I can see that people are very much appreciating uh, the work that you're doing and giving this talk. So um, that's really good to hear. I um, So what I will do is I will keep looking to the comment section on Facebook. What I did want to mention is I wanted to mention about some of the supports that are being offered um, that are COVID specific or specific to this um, time. So what we've done is we've put together a list of um, resources for pregnancy, birth and postpartum during um, COVID-19. And um, one of the services that I'd like to highlight is the Royal Sea Prompt Clinic. Um, so this is a temporary outpatient clinic that's been established at the Royal to meet urgent care needs during COVID-19. Um, some of the services that are provided are urgent assessments, uh, medication support, short-term psychotherapy um, for a maximum of four sessions per client, um, and help, help with accessing other services, um, so systems navigation. And this is if this is something that um, you feel would be helpful to you, then you would need to talk to um, an, your nurse practitioner or you would need to talk to your physician. Also, if it's something that interests you, you could also talk to your midwife about this because this is some, a service that they could help you access. Um, so I just, I'm still keeping my eye on the comment section to see if there's any questions. Um, what we're going to do with this resources is I'm going to try to 
post it to the comment section. And then um, after our talk, we're going to be looking at attaching it to the Ottawa Birth and Wellness Center um, website. So it might be um, a link that's under COVID-19 or it might be a separate um, tab. And so I just wanna tell you some of the things that are on the document that we're going to be sharing with you. So um, some of the information is COVID-19 specific, which is guidelines that the hospitals are using, um, guidelines at Health Canada and the College of Midwives. Um, we also are including some crisis lines um, for people that uh, have, are needing immediate crisis support. Um, we're also, I want to point out that there is a lot of programs that are being run online. So some of them are web-based um, information that has already been pre-recorded and maybe some resources on that webpage. And then some other ones are groups that you can, can join and are actively happening on Zoom. So um, I think that'll be interesting for people to take a look at that. Another um, support is Postpartum Support International, which is um, an American organization, but they do have a lot of um, chat rooms where people can go and chat about different things. And that includes um, uh, dads that may be experiencing some uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So that's Postpartum Support International. I also want people to know that our local supports are also offering things online. So Family Services Ottawa is um, the organization that runs the Baby Blues uh, program, which is a 10 week structured uh, group program for moms. And they usually meet at the Family Services Ottawa um, office. But now I understand that they're going to be doing offering that program via video conferencing. And also individual counseling is available through Family Services Ottawa. Um, I'm looking at I know that Mothercraft, Teresa, I believe that Mothercraft is offering online um, groups for mothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have a number of services and um, it's easier to go onto their Facebook page where you'll have more current information, but you can always give them a call as well. Um, and in addition, I wanted to point out that although breastfeeding drop-ins are closed for in-person assessments, that lactation consultants and um, the drop-ins around the city are uh, open for virtual visits and for phone calls. So there is breastfeeding support available um, in addition to the support that midwives provide at home, for example. Perfect, I think you listed, I think we have that listed on here, quite a yeah. few um, resources that people can access. So mm -hmm. when you look on our resource page, we have, um, we have the website, so you can access through the website, and then we also have um, any relevant uh, telephone numbers. So um, we also have information on mental health, so um, some websites with coping techniques for anxiety, some facts and anxiety and, and um, managing stress. Um, and there's also a safety planning um, website, Unsafe, at home in Ottawa, um, a secure text and online chat service for women who may be uh, living through extreme or increased violence and abuse at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we'll have the information on the, on the web, on the, on the resource there as well. And I also wanted to point out that a lot of the community resource centers in Ottawa are continuing their services. However, they're continuing them online. So um, we've gone through the different community resource centers and listed um, any updates that they had on their website and any contact information for specific programs. So I'm just glancing down here at the Facebook um, our questions. And so I'm not seeing any questions. Are there any last minute thoughts? That oh, Nancy, I'm gonna interrupt you. There are some questions. Okay, um, Stephanie. Someone has asked, can you define active labor because it seems to vastly differ? Nicole, did you want to answer that one? Yeah, sure. So usually active labor um, 
we're defining it as sort of three to four centimeters dilated, maybe four to five centimeters dilated with a changing cervix. So contractions that are progressively changing the cervix is usually what most people use to define active labor. It might differ a little bit just depending on the clinical situation in terms of if, if this question is asking what I think I'm asking, basically when, when can I bring my partner in if I'm not in active labor and I am admitted. Um, it may depend on, for example, if we've tried uh, some, some cervical ripening agents like a Cervidil or a Foley catheter, and now we're changing over to oxytocin to cause those strong contractions. That might be the time when your care provider who's in charge, for example, a nurse or a midwife, says that you can bring your partner in. Um, it really depends on the institution and it depends on the clinical situation, but usually active labor is like good strong contractions that are progressively changing your cervix and you're around four centimeters dilated. Any input, uh, Teresa, in regards to our at the birth center? What yes, are so, we to define active labor? Sorry. I would agree with Nicole, and uh, that's something that's defined by the practitioner and the client as well together. Um, because at the birth center, we did offer um, a space where people could use the family lounge or they could walk outside, they could um, use one of our rooms to await for active labor to start. And this is what sometimes in the case, say, of someone who has a history of having their baby very quickly um, and maybe is starting some signs of labor, um, is checked at the birth center, is found to not quite be in active labor. Because when labor isn't really active, it can stop and start. And this can last for a day or two or more sometimes. So um, it's, we did have that um, possibility in the birth center for people to, to stay in the birth center to see if their, their labor was gonna perk up or to use some of the methods that we can offer non-pharmacological or not using uh, medications to try and get a labor going. Um, for example, a breast pump um, or what um, Nicole mentioned, the Foley catheter. So we're not, um, we're not offering that service at the birth center right now. And what the midwives are doing is, is offering that at home. Um, so again, to limit the amount of time that someone is in the space and to decrease the amount of cleaning that the birth center aid will, would have to do um, because that would involve three different spaces in addition to the public space. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I know Nicole, you mentioned um, postnatal care uh, previously. I just question is, uh, have there been any changes with postnatal care due to COVID? So yes and no, not really. I would say in general, we're still offering like our normal home pre or postpartum visits, uh, our normal postpartum check-ins. However, some of the time those visits are taking place virtually, a few of the visits are taking place virtually. So um, I would say uh, it's more common if a, if a person has had a couple of babies before and they feel comfortable, they're confident that, you know, feeding is going well, weight gain is going normally, they have no concerns, then we might change change um, one of the later visits to a telephone check-in. However, if it's your first baby, you're still trying to get your breastfeeding on board, you're needing more support, then we will still, of course, do our, our normal pattern of visits. It just kind of depends clinically what's going on. So in midwifery care, for those who don't know, we usually do three home visits in the first week where we come to your home and check you and baby out. So usually day one, three and five. If you gave birth and are staying over in the hospital, sometimes that first visit's taking place in the hospital instead. And then we usually check in with you again at two weeks of age, of your baby's age, four weeks of age, and then we do a final discharge visit. Uh, and those last three visits usually take place in the clinic. So sometimes that pattern is gonna change a little bit in COVID-19 where we're gonna change some of those visits to virtual visits, but not always. Perfect, thank you, Nicole. Um, another question, what do you recommend for care for older children during uh, labor birth given current social distancing uh, guidelines to limit uh, household contact only? What precautions should our child care provider follow in the weeks leading up to birth? That's a good question. Um, I think that like I can, I can take a stab at it, Teresa, if you have anything to add. Um, I would say that if you have someone that you're designating as your 
child's care provider, like you're, you're in, anticipating your baby's going to come in the next couple of weeks or months, and you have some older children that you know are going to need care. Um, if you can identify who will be caring for them, and then if it's possible for that person to like self-isolate, like we all are supposed to be doing anyway, that's a pretty good way to um, make sure that that person is going to be healthy in order to look after your older children and limit exposure to everybody. Um, and then, yeah, if you can kind of keep it to one provider, I think is helpful. Um, but it is challenging. We have less sort of resources to draw upon at this time. So I think if you can make a plan ahead of time, that that's probably going to be the most helpful thing. Do you have anything to add, Teresa? Yeah, I would just add, um, as we always would say, it's wise to make a plan A, plan B, plan C, or maybe D, E, F, but make, make different plans depending on the circumstances. So um, if it's possible to have one designated person, that sounds great, but that might not be possible and you might have to have a different plan. Also, your plans might change. You might be planning a home birth or a birth center birth and end up having to or wanting choosing to go to the hospital or vice versa. So depending on how your plans change, that might change who your care provider is. It might also be the middle of the night as it usually is. Um, what, what do you have in, um, as a plan, depending on the day, the time that you will be needing this provider? So uh, if you have a, a, a number of different scenarios that can go a long way to make you feel more comfortable. And I know that midwives uh, that I have spoken to recently are suggesting that people who are going to be supporting you um, in that way, uh, either your support person, also yourself, and anybody that's going to be there for childcare should also be, as you said, isolating themselves in anticipation um, a, a few weeks before your due date. Thank you to you both. Um, so far, no new questions. Um, there are a lot of participants, which is really great. Um, a lot of people are watching and tuning in. Um, but we will definitely, if you have any questions after this presentation, uh, we will definitely be answering them or guiding you towards um, the right person that could answer that question for you. Um, any, Nancy or Nicole or Teresa, any final words? I do. I just want to say um, Nancy and Teresa have put together like a really amazing resource list. So I know that right now, most people who are pregnant or parenting are feeling like, what do I do? All my supports are gone. Everything's evaporated. The media is crazy. It's totally overwhelming. I've got all this information thrown at me and you just feel really anxious and overwhelmed, which is normal, totally, totally normal. But please have a look at this list of resources because there, there is actually a lot more support out there than you'd think. Um, it's different support and it's, it's changed. It's not what we're used to, but it's still excellent and it could really, really help. So try your best to uh, have a look at that list and, and think, think some flexibility so that you can try some things that will hopefully help. Mm -hmm. I would add to never be afraid or ashamed to ask for help. We all need help sometimes, and there's no shame in it. And um, it takes a great deal of courage and understanding yourself to know that uh, I'm out of my depth here. I need some extra help. I need some support. And again, the, the events of pregnancy, labor, birth, and having a baby are... are um, critical moments. They're moments that can change an equilibrium and shift you into possibly needing some support. We have an awful lot of courage and resilience as human beings and uh, particularly as women having babies. We have a lot of, of insight when we're pregnant into our own bodies and into our own needs like instinct is really important so again and for anybody who is supporting someone through uh, the childbearing process also if you notice or feel that your loved one is not herself or 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 could possibly use some extra help please offer that um, because 
it is something that we do, we're very, very lucky where we are um, in this area to have all those wonderful supports and they're still out there and there is help. So no shame in asking for it. Um, it's, it's something that can really change your whole experience. And I just wanted to say to everyone, if you've enjoyed this um, Facebook Live, there's also another Facebook Live um, with Dr. Giroux, who is talking about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So I really encourage people to check that out. That's located on the Ottawa Birth and Wellness, um, their Facebook page. And I just want to thank um, Nicole and Teresa for taking time out of their very busy schedules to um, inform us and let us know what's available and what's happening. And I also want to thank Stephanie. Um, without Stephanie, we wouldn't be able to manage this because she's our Zoom and uh, Facebook expert. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us. And one last um, question. Oh, I'm so sorry. One last question. Um, what are the guidelines for visitors after the birth uh, and visiting newborns? Um. Okay, I'll touch on a couple of different things. So I guess I'm, I'm just thinking about the different settings that you can deliver. So at the birth center and at the hospital, it's still your one support person only. So there are no visitors allowed on the postpartum unit or into the birthing room where you've delivered. Just the one person that you've had with you the whole time, presumably. Same with the birth center. So we used to normally in non-pandemic times, you could you know invite the rest of your family into the birthing room to visit you and the newborn baby maybe an hour after the birth, but right now, no, it's still the same one person that you had with you. Um, at home, I mean, I think out of uh, respect for the limitation, like trying to limit exposure to your midwives, your midwives will likely say, you know, you're one or two support people with you who've been with you through the labor. And then once your midwives leave, it's your home. I mean, you can do whatever you like in your own home. Um, but right now, how it works uh, in most settings in, in at the birth center and at the hospital is just your one support person. Um, when you are transferred from the room you delivered in at the hospital over to the postpartum unit, if you're staying, uh, for example, for 24 hours, which a lot of people do, um, your support person will go with you and they will stay there with you in that room. Uh, they will not be allowed to leave the room until you're ready to be discharged from the hospital. Perfect. Any other questions, Stephanie? Uh, nope, that is all. Okay, great. So I guess we're saying goodbye then. Okay, thank, thank you everyone. You for thank joining you, us. Teresa. Thank you, Nancy. Sorry. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.